I'm sorry, guys. That sort of uh, took a lot longer. Thanks a lot, Ron, and and um, also Tony for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for inviting me. It's great to be here and uh, contribute to your conference. You know, I must say that it. You know, Ron, Tony, and Rob, you guys have done a great job uh, getting this all organized. And uh, you know, you guys at COO have an impressive organization. I, it's, it's it's quite amazing. Quite amazing, um, actually. Um, I've got eight uh, cameras at my remote station, and and this is a screenshot from the camera at the uh, top of the uh, main tower. Uh, and this is a view uh, looking northwest toward Japan. And in fact, if you look closely, you can see the uh, 80 and 40 meter uh, Yagi uh, elements. Okay, let's talk about my move from my uh, typical suburban lot uh, in Calgary, which is uh, shown here. Uh, to uh, you know, to the remote. Uh, by the way, the slide has moved. We're good. Yes, it yes. Yes. All right. Let's keep going. So I operated from this QTH for 17 years, and and I always felt relatively competitive on the low bands. Uh, in fact, on 80 meters, it it actually seemed I could keep up with some of the big boys from the uh, west coast. You know, uh, working the long path into Europe, my little baby two element uh, 80 meter Yagi could uh, could keep up. And on 160, uh, during the last solar minimum, I was you know working about 100 DXCC each winter. Um, and I, you know, I talked to a lot of the local uh, guys uh, here that also were active, and often they weren't even able to hear the uh, DX that I was working. So, you know, the reason I'm bringing this up is something was going on, and my conclusion was that uh, my home uh, is on what's called Broadcast Hill. I mean, it's the highest point in the city. And uh, I did some HAFTA analysis and confirmed that, in fact, uh, being on this hill was indeed uh, giving, me, uh, giving me a bump. So therefore, the number one focus for the remote was uh, to find a hill that provided enhanced takeoff angles. Uh, I mean, all potential locations were evaluated with HAFTA. Uh, of course, I wanted a rural, uh, low, no low noise setting, and I needed uh, room for uh, RX antennas. So I used some topo maps and Google Earth to, uh, to help with the search and eventually found uh, two sites. Uh, one was an abandoned 1960s microwave site near a town called Bergen, but that deal fell through. And I ended up finding uh, this uh, piece of land, which uh, is about 100, and, uh, 100 kilometers north of my QTH. Um, you know, a one-way trip uh, takes, about, uh, takes about an hour and a half. I can go either the uh, long way up the main highway or what's called Cowboy Trail. Uh, so I figured, you know, this, uh, this would have been uh, manageable as far as the drive goes. Uh, this map uh, includes some topographic contours. Hopefully you can see them there. And uh, uh, shows this really unlikely hill in the middle of the prairies. I mean, it's a bump in the prairies. Uh, the 10 acre parcel that was for sale is shown outlined in this uh, yellow box. And uh, the luck was uh, it was uh, actually uh, for sale. Uh, it was all treed. Um, uh, zoom in here. So it was all treed, 100% treed and uh, completely undeveloped raw land. Um, and it had sat in the market for quite a long time. And uh, so the sellers were somewhat motivated. And I think I got a pretty good deal, to be honest with you. I think that perhaps uh, potential buyers were a little bit uh, put off by the need to build a road and, and the fact that it hadn't been developed. What I did need uh, was power. And indeed, there was power along the main county road. And I needed uh, uh, internet. Well, it turns out that I share this hill with a bunch of comm towers, which I've annotated here. Uh, the one here to the east actually is one of my internet service providers. And then this tower, actually the closest tower also had a uh, WiMAX provider on it. This uh, microwave tower here to the west, it's actually a 500 foot uh, microwave tower. So here's a view uh, of the hill uh, taken from about uh, Google Earth, uh, you know, street view. It's about seven kilometers uh, to the southwest. Uh, I don't know if you guys know it, but in Google Earth, you can draw a line through anything and, and um, uh, plot an elevation profile. This is the profile um, looking to Oceania and to Europe with the, uh, the, the remote location on the top of this little hill. And here's the terrain profile um, to, uh, to Japan and, uh, and South America. So 
Uh, I'm not going to show the details because there's just not enough time for this uh, in terms of the, the, the terrain analysis, but I did do a uh, half analysis on this. And again, I was motivated because of my experience in the city that I, I, I knew that you know, being on a hill was good. But this just shows the, uh, what I was dealing with about uh, 2,500 feet out uh, from the crest of the hill. You know, I'm about 150 to 300 feet above the uh, surrounding terrain and out at uh, 9,000 uh, feet, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still two to 400 feet uh, above the surrounding terrain. Uh, so uh, let me give you a quick tour of how I developed the remote. Um, uh, it's, uh, this is kind of the preliminary development plan. I mean, basically I needed to blast a road in here and clear the trees to um, uh, house the radio equipment. And I also wanted a uh, place for a nine circle uh, receiver ray. Uh, here's as we were starting to uh, build the road, uh, what I decided to do was harvest the trees uh, rather than uh, just uh, take them down and burn them. I, I had a feller buncher come in and a, a delimmer. I don't know if you've ever seen a delimmer work, but it's really a, a cool thing. Um, it turns out that this these trees are really old growth. I don't think it's ever been cleared and a lot of the trees were kind of rotten. Uh, so I didn't really achieve the cost recovery I had hoped, but I, I mean, I almost uh, broke, e broke even for the tree clearing. Uh, this is a view of the approach. Uh, it comes right off of the north, uh, rather east-west county road, which is paved. So it's, uh, you know, it's a nice, uh, nice approach for getting in. This is a view of the uh, steel high hog fence that I installed. Uh, this is my first uh, point of entry barrier to uh, prevent any uh, ingress, anyone that might want to come uh, come into the remote. This is at the top of the hill uh, as we were just beginning to, uh, you know, finish finish up clearing the trees. You know, we burned all the unharvested trees and uh, buried um, some of the stumps. And here's a view after we removed the topsoil and uh, replaced it with clay. Um, you know, as you'll see later, this eventually gets covered in uh, gravel. Um, I, I brought in overhead power from the main road, as I said, um, you know, the, the cost wasn't that bad and uh, there, you, there's only four poles to the road, but um, it, maybe as, as you guys all know, um, the, you know, this ends up ultimately being amortized on my electrical bill. In fact, I mean, my delivery charge is more than my actual electrical uh, use uh, charge. Um, I decided to house the equipment in a um, uh, construction or oil field uh, work personnel trailer. Uh, you know, I considered a CCAN, but I, I, I kind of felt this was would be a better solution and and perhaps easier to customize. Uh, and and in fact, this is that trailer. It's a 10 foot by 24 foot. Um, uh, box and I decided to wall off the uh, seven feet at the one end and install or uh, put a uh, just a regular rack in the middle for the equipment so that I could you know have access and walk around it. Um, this is a view of the trailer before I built the um, built the room in the back. Uh, you can see there is air conditioning in it and that is the room with that the radio is housed in. Um, here on the left I'm you know just framing in the wall um, I used a steel outside door because it's insulated and uh, insulated this wall as well. Uh, reason being that I, as I say, I, I usually just keep this one end of the shack uh, warm uh, during the winter and cool in the winter. Uh, on the right is the finished product and this end I'm standing in is kind of my workroom. It has my tools and my, uh, my workbench. Uh, in the radio room, I built a shelf uh, to house the PCs uh, and the monitors. Um, here, here is the main, uh, the equipment rack, um, on, on the top, uh, is kind of what I would call my, um, power distribution and switching. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the, this middle rack is sort of my LAN stuff, uh, the K3, uh, the station master switch, uh, switching, uh, my rotor controller, power master, and then the lowest shelf that you can see, there's the flex radio and the ACOM 2000A amplifier. Out of sight on the bottom rack is a, another amplifier and the uh, PCs. Uh, here's a view around the back of the shack, uh, sorry, rack, um, you know, so I can walk around here and deal with the mess of wires. Um, this panel here is my entry point. It's a solid copper entry panel, which 
is integrated into the ground radio system and the DC ground. Every single wire is either MOV, gas discharge tube protected, or uh, you know lightning arresters on the coax. Um, I installed a six foot uh, chain link fence uh, with two 10 foot gates. Uh, I've also included some warning signs, you know, like uh, high RF voltages on the tower structures, you know, don't enter or you will die kind of thing, just to try and prevent anyone from thinking they might want to climb the tower. Uh, the entire uh, fenced in area is covered uh, with, with radials. Um, Here's a view of Yankin, the uh, US tower crank up out of the home uh, QTH. I um, hired a 50 ton crane with a 150 foot stick with a jib out to, to get it over the top of the house. Uh, to the right, you can see I'm loading it on a 40 foot um, trailer with a, with a truck, uh, with a picker truck so that it can be offloaded at the remote. You probably can't see it, but on, the, on that trailer is also a prefabbed rebar cage. I, for the US tower base, I gave the, the plans to a refar, a rebar fabricator and they made it for me. And then these guys picked it up rather than trying to do my own uh, rebar work. And in fact, here we are at the remote. Um, uh, this is the US tower base. You know, I followed their, you know, plans uh, for the base. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it's overkill. I mean, this hole's nine feet deep and six feet square. I've got the rebar cage in there. Um, boy, my backhoe guy did a tremendous job. I mean, these, these, whole, these sides of this hole is almost perfectly straight. Uh, but anyway, super easy to fill. I mean, you know, unlike a backyard job, I mean, we just back up the cement truck and fill her up and run the vibrator and we are good to go. Um, here I am raising the uh, US tower. Um, I happen to already own and have this raising fixture from a US tower. It's, a, it's, a, it's an accessory. And I was able to do this all myself. I used my man lift with some slings and some uh, come alongs. And uh, I was you know, able to get this, the, the tower bolted onto the, um, the, the tower wings. And then this, with the raising fixture, I just crank it up uh, to, to vertical. Um, on the right, uh, you can see the tower at, at cranked up at full height with no antennas on it. Uh, th this is a, a powered, uh, auto, you know, a motorized crank up, and I have it configured so I can raise and lower the tower remotely from Calgary. And I also have a wind gauge, which over a certain wind speed, it will um, automatically retract. Uh, here is, this is, this is why I love my uh, man lift. Um, I can work on anything on this tower uh, when it's cranked down to 24 feet. Uh, honestly, I mean, what a pleasure uh, to do antenna work. Um, you know, I can even go out and work on the element tips if I want. Uh, this, by the way, the Yaggies weren't fully assembled yet, but I, I bought this man lift used from uh, Ritchie Brothers uh, auction. Um, I had a greater level the pad, the, the, the area, which is 100, by the way, the fenced in area is 140 feet square. I might've forgotten to mention that. Uh, this was to prep for the ground radials. Um, and uh, I, I shunt feed the tower uh, for 160 meters. And so uh, this is the ground system for that. Um, I have three eighths inch tubing, copper tubing all the way around the base. Uh, onto which the, the radials are soldered. Um, and then two inch wide copper straps are then in four places bonded to the, uh, to the, to the tower. Uh, there's a hundred radials. And as I say, they all go outwards and are actually electrically bonded to the uh, chain, chain link fence. Let's have a drink here. Hopefully I'm not going too fast, but I'm, I'm trying to, I, 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 we had a bit of a delay there with me, so I, I don't want to go over time here. Um, this, is, this is the Yaggies that I have on the tower. Um, at the bottom, on the right here is a zoom in. Uh, on the bottom is the two element uh, 80 and 40 meter Yaggy. These are the, this is the same Yaggy I had at the city location for the low bands. And above that is an opti beam, the OB95. I, don't really use that very much. It's pretty rare to find me above um, 40 meters. Um, I shunt feed 
the tower for 160 meters. It, you may or may not be able to see the shunt wire to the right of the uh, tower. But um, here's the thing, after my second winter season on 160 meters, uh, I started to realize that I kind of like had more RX and less uh, TX, uh, especially into Europe uh, with the guys operating in a high noise environment. You know, I could kind of hear them, but they weren't hearing me. So I needed some TX gain. Uh, I decided on a two element uh, parasitic array uh, using the uh, existing uh, shunt fed tower as the, uh, as the driver. I, I considered a three element uh, parasitic like K3LR and others use. Um, but uh, in the end, I decided that the added one dB of gain uh, really wasn't uh, worth the effort to try and squeeze that other element uh, onto my uh, small little area here. Uh, having said that, the three element design has significantly better a front to back. I mean, it's spectacular. Uh, this two element is pretty crappy, but for the front to back, but I don't use my transmit antennas anyway on receive. So I kind of figured you know, that I can live, live with that. Um, the, the array are, are, is made from these parasitic elements and, and they're, they're made from four inch ir irrigation uh, tubing and they're 75 feet high and uh, loaded with uh, 50 foot uh, uh, long top loading uh, wires to bring them to resonance. And so at any one time, uh, only one element uh, will be active while the other is floating and therefore invisible. And so for example, the, if we look at the, the Southwest parasitic, uh, when tuned uh, as a director, uh, it would be beaming to Oceana. And then with some inductance included and, and tuned as a reflector, it's beaming to Europe. And then of course, conversely, the Southeast element would be beaming to either Japan or, uh, or South America. Um, uh, I modeled the, uh, and designed the array using uh, Fornac 2 as a short picture of the model there on the, uh, on the left. Um, to, I was able to raise these 75 foot elements uh, all by myself using my man lift as an aerial support. Um, I don't know if you can see what's going on here, but I, you know, I attached a, a pulley to the top of the man basket and then a, a, a the pull rope uh, through the pulley goes down to to basically a, a, a boat winch uh, bolted to the to the main tilt support and you know the thing is the these irrigation tubing elements aren't heavy i mean i mean this whole element barely weighs 100 pounds and and so and then once the element was vertical it's it's guide in, in three places um and at three uh, levels uh, using Dacron, Dacron rope. Um, here's the element base for those who might be interested. Um, uh, first of all, there's a four by four post cemented into the ground and then a, basically a two by six bracket uh, with a half inch bolt uh, kind of makes up the hinge point if you kind of see what's going on here. Uh, the element split uh, and uh, you know uh, in, is insulated from the ground. Uh, the main uh, trans, the, the main part of the element, uh, using a four-inch uh, PVC external uh, coupler, right? And then uh, you know I've just drilled a hole to gain electrical uh, access to the to the main uh, to the main element. Um, I, I just want to spend a little bit of time here because I, I think this might be something some of you guys might be interested in because I really like these elements. Uh, the, this uh, four, four inch irrigation tubing comes in uh, 40 foot lengths. I, I purchased it new from an irrigation uh, supply house. And so obviously the, the uh, 75 foot elements are uh, you know, made by a 40 foot piece spliced with a 35 foot piece. And, you can sort of in the inset here, perhaps see my, my approach to uh, making the splice. I essentially uh, s slit a, um, a, two, a two foot length long piece down the middle with my aluminum blade and then compressed it with a worm gear clamps. And then that, that splice is, then, is an internal coupler, okay? And then I just remove the, uh, the hose clamps and, and, and then complete the splice with uh, blind rivets or pop rivets. Um, you know, and uh, this tubing's, uh, most irrigation tubing is 0.058, but in, in my case, I purchased this stuff called torque tube. And I think it's the stuff used um, for the 
mechanical construction of those big irrigation systems, like, um, you know, like the pivots. Um, my stuff is that stuff. It's 0.077 wall and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty solid. Um, and in fact, to the, to the left, you can, uh, to the right, rather, you can see me, it's a picture of me cranking it up. You can see, for one thing, that joint held up pretty well. And, and, you know, there's a decent amount of flex, but it's, it's hanging in there. Uh, one thing I would caution you, though, of course, is, uh, you know, this, this stuff is not made to be structural. It's, it's, it's not, it's, it's got a seam in it. It's not seamless tubing. It's been roll formed. And, it, you know, I, I don't know if I'd want to use it for horizontal elements, but it's been holding up very well um, in the vertical situation. You know, I, I encourage you guys to consider using irrigation tubing for vertical elements. Um, you know, I think it's perhaps cheaper and and maybe easier to install in using tower sections. You know, you know for sure. I think an 80 meter four square would be like really easy. I mean, I don't know. I think you could even like hand bomb it up like Iwo Jima style, like just like hand lift it up with a couple guys. Uh, I actually have plans to raise a 120 foot vertical using six inch what they call suction tube. It's 0.083 wall stuff using um, the falling uh, Derrick method. Uh, and one last thing regarding this array, um, I really warn you that uh, I've learned from experience that parasitic vertical arrays are very sensitive uh, to ground losses uh, at the parasitic element. I mean, both the gain and front to back can diminish really quick uh, if the element uh, current is, is less than ideal. I mean, a no compromise uh, radial system uh, is essential. I mean, you model this, it's easy to do even in a Mininec uh, engine, you introduce some R or some, you know, you just put some series resistance in and watch the front to back uh, crash. Here's a view of my expanded radial system. And, you know, adding radials is not glamorous or visibly rewarding experience, but uh, seriously covering your landscape with copper really, really can pay off. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge for me. I got to be on my hands and knees in the forest here, running wires under deadfall. But, but it's uh, it's definitely wor uh, worth it. I think I'm going to rename this hill Copper Hill. That's almost three acres of uh, radials. All right, let's talk about my receive antennas. Um, uh, I own only the 10 acres of land shown here. Uh, you can see my road in my main area, but. I don't own the surrounding land, but my neighbor was very a friendly guy and has allowed me to run wires out into the uh, surrounding uh, forest. I have a total of 15 uh, beverages. They range from uh, 750 to 1,000 feet long. Uh, and I cover nine directions uh, with those. I have six broadside phased pairs uh, with 400 foot interwire spacing and three single wires. I also have a nine uh, circle uh, array lost my mouse here. Um, I want to talk about my experience with broadside phased pairs because um, I've used and experimented a lot with on echelon and fire staggered pairs quite a bit but you know until I moved out to the remote I, I, I never had room for broadside pairs and, and I gotta tell you these these antennas are amazing. I'd have a drink there. Uh, so this is a view uh, of out of my four neck two model of a single uh, beverage wire. It's got an RDF of around uh, 11.7. Now, I'm assuming you guys all know about RDF or at least have heard about it, but a better RDF received directivity factor really truly does translate into a better copy. So what if we take two of these wires, two beverage wires and space them anywhere from one half to three quarters of a wavelength apart. And uh, we combine them, uh, you know, we'll just use equal length uh, feed lines to a central point, uh, combining them in phase with a zero degree hybrid combiner or a magic T. So if we do that, um, here's a four neck two output of a broadside pair face uh, space 200 uh, feet apart. Okay, now um, uh, I've overlaid that with the single wire, a beverage in blue. And so we've gained three dB of at forward gain. Well, of course we have, because we've now got two wires in phase. Um, but you'll notice the RDF uh, indeed has improved. We're now up to 13.1 instead of 11 uh, dB. Uh, but if we ex space these 400 feet apart, um, we 
uh, increase the RDF to 14 uh, dB, uh, dB. But it's important to notice here that our forward 3 dB half power beam width is really narrowed, okay? I mean, we've narrowed it out and that's, that's why the uh, RDF is improving. And in fact, if we space these now uh, uh, 500 feet apart, uh, you know, then we're up to 15 uh, R, uh, dB of RDF, which is, you know, re really a spectacular uh, antenna. Um, uh, now, one question is, you know, do these things really work? And all I can say is an astounding yes. I mean, they really and truly uh, work. And now I've designed the feed box for all of my phased pairs to include some relays so that I can uh, instantly, uh, so like I can switch between any one individual wire or have them phased. And so therefore, uh, the point is I can do A, B comparisons between a single wire or the phased pair. And many times uh, with doing these testings, you know, that extra two or three dB of RDF has absolutely made the copy, uh, the difference between copy or no copy. Like I'm barely hearing them on the single wire, but the, uh, the pair uh, pops them out of the noise. Um, all right, so the thing is though, there can be compromises with these antennas. Um, because of the narrow forward beam width. And in fact, in this diagram, what I'm showing here, at first I had a, a pair to the north and a pair to a, the classic European 45 degree azimuth uh, direction, okay? And uh, last winter, I started to notice that I might have a problem here because uh, Northern Europe and uh, like even the OHs in Russia seem to almost be better on my North pair than on the Europe pair and um, something had to be going on. So I plotted these together. And of course you already can see what the problem is. I mean, I'm four dB down in this notch between these two. And at first you might say, well, you know, well, whatever, but here's the whatever. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, a great circle plot from my QTH and V6 for that exact notch. And it turns out there's some juicy stuff in here. I mean, you know, I've got Norway and Sweden and Finland and Poland and, you know, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, uh, you know, lot, most of European Russia. So uh, I reckoned I needed to, uh, to add another uh, pair. And in fact, uh, that is what I did. I added a, a, a pair to 21 degrees to fill in that, uh, that notch. And uh, the point here is this winter, this pair, this pair has really added to my RX. I mean, switching uh, between at times shows that, you know, the LYs, SMs, you know, um, the YLs, the, the OHs, you know, can be really, really solid on that 21 degree pair. But if I switch back to the regular European pair, in some cases, they're almost gone. So, I mean, it, it really, truly has made the difference. And, and in fact, conversely, I mean, you know, the Germans and the French and Italians uh, and in the UK are, are, are always better on the, the 45 degree pair. And so, Anyway, you know, for contesting, I mean, I don't know, what does this mean? You know, it, I, you know, maybe it could be a problem, right? I mean, in the sense that, you know, it's just going to be a whole lot of switching, but, but the one thing is it's, it's, a, there's a price for everything. I mean, there's no free lunch. I mean, you know, an antenna with a more broad forward beam width is just, won't have the same RDF and maybe, and likely will not be hearing as well. I mean, most of the time uh, these uh, broadside pairs will out here my uh, nine circle array. Uh, speaking of which, um, moving along here, I, I wanna talk about my uh, nine circle uh, receive array because for a lot of guys, I think this is a, a, a real meaningful option for a smaller lot. And, and I built this to complement the uh, beverage system because I am always on 160 meters uh, using a diversity uh, receive. That is, you know, the beverages in one ear and the nine circle in another. I cleared some trees off to the uh, west to uh, make room for this, uh, this array. And uh, here's, here's what it looks like uh, in the field. Um, it's it, really what it is, is uh, one central vertical uh, surrounded by eight other uh, verticals. Uh, but really at any one time, uh, there's really only three verticals that are active. Uh, and basically they're in a three element uh, end fire uh, uh, setup. Uh, the elements are uh, 25 feet high, just aluminum whips. Um, and they're spaced about uh, 60 feet apart. Um, 
so about 120 foot circle. There are no radials required. These are fed at a high impedance point with just a ground rod. Um, this array was developed by John W1FV uh, and marketed by the YCC Contest Club uh, through DX Engineering, although they don't sell it anymore. Um, and, and John did the modeling and sorted out the optimum phase and, and, and um, uh, amplitudes on the three elements to develop this just excellent, excellent uh, pattern. Um, and in fact, uh, here it is compared, the, uh, the nine circle in red to a single a beverage, uh, a single beverage wire, and um, you'll notice that the RDF. I mean, they're they're basically equal. Uh, uh, in fact, you could argue the nine circle is slightly better, but at this this doesn't really mean anything uh, in modeling. But it's, they're they're close. But really, it, uh, the real benefit here is you've got this beautiful, uh, more enhanced. Let's put it that way, a uh, beam width on the front. So you know that's a, that's a plus. Uh, and the way the nine circle gets away with that is it's got really excellent control with these rearward, uh, rear, rearward lobes. So, I mean, if you think about it, what do you got going here with one of these? Well, it's, it, this is like having eight 918 foot long or, you know, 900 foot beverages, eight of them uh, all in a 120 foot circle. So uh, pretty, pretty effective uh, antenna. These are the high impedance uh, amplifiers uh, that I designed in KiCad and built. Um, it's, it's an op amp based um, amp and John W1FV designed them and they're, they're really quite phase stable and, and immune to IMD. Uh, here, here's one mounted at the base of the vertical. Uh, this is the combiner box that I also designed. And in this case, I integrated a high impedance, a, a, a 2N5109 amp on the output to include on the board, uh, all of these, uh, small vertical arrays require amplification. I, I put it in aluminum box and, and, and put it out in the field in this, you know, just a storage bin from, from um, the building, building supply. And this, this includes, you know, the box as well as the, the delay lines are all stuffed in there. One thing I did want to talk about here, guys, is diversity receive. Um, if you have not used diversity receive yet, uh, you really ought to give it a try. Uh, I, I'm sure mo many of you know what it's about, but on 160 meters, I am 100% of the time always using diversity. I mean, it's never turned off. Uh, I mean, it's a simple concept, right? You go, you know, two phase locked receivers that track when you're tuning and stereo headphones. And basically you have, you know, a different antenna in each ear. Um, I'll usually use the nine circle in one ear and the beverages in the other. And Sometimes on 80, I'll even use the Yagi in one ear and the beverages in the other. Um, look, I've been using Diversity RX for at least 10 years. And okay, this is gonna sound like a bold statement, okay? But most of the time, and I mean most of the time, diversity makes the difference between copy and no copy on the weak ones. Okay, now obviously, obviously, it's, you know, if it's a strong signal, it's not going to make a difference. But I'm talking on the weak ones. There's some kind of magic that happens where the gaps get filled in. Um, like, I mean, and it's not just like big long term fading here. I'm talking about like even a dash somehow, like maybe with only one antenna, you wouldn't quite get that whole dash like in your head. It's, I, I can't even explain how it happens, but it's, it, there, there's some kind of magic. Um, also, uh, for contesting, uh, obviously, it's an invaluable tool. I'm sure many of you already do this, but you know, for me, uh, I'd be losing a ton of mults if it weren't for this. I mean, if I've got all ears on Europe, uh, you know, if Texas is calling right uh, off the back, uh, yeah, I'm not going to hear them for sure. Uh, so I'll basically have the nine circle will be the uh, roving uh, antenna looking for uh, other callers. I lost my mouse here on the rear. Uh, okay, so how do I control all this mess um, uh, from home? Well, as I said earlier, I've, I've got, uh, I'm fortunate, I got two internet providers and I've got accounts with both of them. Uh, it helps with uh, redundancy and, um, uh, you know, and, and sort of, uh, you know, spreading the bandwidth uh, a little bit. 
uh, so you know it's it's been it's been great to, uh, to to have that option to have two providers. By by the way, the speed is pretty nominal. It's like a one megabit per second upload and only a four a megabits per second download. So by home standards, it's pretty crappy, but it's more more than enough. Um, uh, okay, so how do I switch things at the remote? Um, I won't go into the details here, but uh, basically uh, anything that is frequency dependent is automated, okay? Uh, I mean, my 160 meter array is band switched and so is my 80 meter and 40 meter Yagis. I've got multiple relays to move across the band. And, you know, I'm certainly can't man a mechanical switch, but I tell you what, even if I'm uh, was at my, at my home QTH, I'm not gonna be manning a mechanical switch to move my, uh, my antenna around the band, especially in a contest. So, I mean, really any kind of mechanical band switching nowadays is, 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 is kind of yesterday. Um, everyone should be moving this way and I'm sure most of you, uh, most of you do. Um, so what about the rotors? Uh, my uh, TX arrays and receive antennas? Well, um, here's how I do it. Uh, this is a view, just saying I'm gonna have a drink of water. Um, so this is a view of uh, one of the PCs uh, at the remote, okay? Now, there's a lot of, lot of windows here, but just focus on these dials here, okay? These are my uh, uh, controllers to, to change directions. This is a program called PST Rotator, PST Rotator. I gotta tell you, it's, I think it's one of the best ham software packages ever. It's just fabulous, but anyway, this blue dial is my main rotor. So I just click click anywhere and the rotor starts, and my Yagis are moving. The other three dials, the yellow one is for my uh, transmitter array. This is for my beverages, the green one, and the, to the right is my nine circle. So um, I click east, uh, I'm going east. I, you know, so it's just a point and shoot method, okay? Contesting is not optimal, but it's the way it is. I can't have a mechanical switch. Um, in a remote uh, setting. Um, so when I click these dials, um, what I'm doing is uh, activating one of these three. Uh, this is my relay switchboard at the remote. The one at the top here where my cursor is, that, that drives my transmit array. Uh, this one is the nine circle, this box, uh, this relay board, and, and this one to the right of the beverages. So there are eight relay beverage uh, relay boards. So you know, if I click to the east, the east relay will be activated, and and so on and so forth, and and so the receive antennas uh, follow me. Uh, one other thing I'll show you: there's a, this is an eight uh, sixteen relay board uh, here, and I'll go back here, and this is controlled by this GUI here, this this user interface at the top. Okay, so I mean, I can turn the lights outside on, uh, you know, on or off, and I can crank the tower up or down, and I mean, I. I I mean, obviously you can do anything, you know, whatever you want. This is how I control things. If I need to turn something uh, on or uh, on or off. By the way, uh, in this view, that's my wind alarm there. It's connected to an antiometer and it, it, it triggers a relay to bring the uh, tower down if the wind gusts too much. So, uh, okay, so here I am at home. So uh, this is what it looks like at home. Um, you know, the operating position. So to the right here uh, is that very uh, PC, but I'm logged in. I'm logged in with, in this case, I think any desk. I've moved that way away from TeamViewer. I found any desk to be better, but you know, if you haven't used a remote desktop application, I mean, uh, th when I operate this remotely, it's, it's just as though I'm sitting at the remote. And so therefore I can control everything uh, with, that, with that PC. Uh, you can notice uh, perhaps in the picture, the K3, it's the K3 mini, uh, it's connected to the remote through the remote rig boxes. Um, but that's not my radio of choice uh, anymore. I find that I'm using the Flex. I like its ergonomics better for operating the remote and uh, the Flex uh, software, the smart SDR software is shown on the left screen. So uh, that's how I control, uh, control the, the radio. And um, you, over here, if you can see my cursor, that's called the Flex knob. And I, so that gives me the ability for tuning and RIT and, and things, uh, things like that. Um, so here's a zoom in on the um, uh, that same that same PC uh, logged in remotely, and uh, in this case uh, I, I'm using Logger 32, and there's my logging logging program. So I will log everything at the PC that's sitting at the remote by 
basically driving the PC. It's like I'm sitting at the remote, but I'm sitting at home. I'm just using that PC. And all CW is sent using this little thing here where my cursor is called the CW machine. So all keyboard, uh, all, all CW is sent via the keyboard. Uh, this is the same thing when I'm operating a contest, except it's N1MM. In other words, N1MM is not loaded at home, it's loaded at the PC at the remote and the contest is being run from the PC at the remote. And, and that's why CW is uh, saved. I mean, I don't have to worry about packet loss. It's being sent from the PC uh, locally. Uh, so here is my traveling uh, radio uh, shack. Uh, I mean, this is it. This is a complete radio shack on my laptop. I mean, I can connect anywhere in the world, uh, even with an LTE connection and I have full control. Well, in fact, here is that the smart SDR software driving the flex radio and I shrunk the window, right? So it's on half of the computer screen. And then I've logged into that, the control PC and I've shrunk it on the uh, right side. So, I mean, I can control my, I can control everything. I mean, I can turn the antennas, I can switch uh, the receive antennas, I can turn the amps on and off and I can send uh, my CW from uh, the key, uh, the keyboard, um, you know, uh, you know, let's be honest. Yeah, uh, you know, no CW paddle. I don't have the paddle. Okay, look, uh, I love my paddle too, but really it's no big deal using keyboard CW. I mean, at the end of the day, you get used to it and you learn how to call up the keyboard and you, it's, it's, you know, it's not a perfect world, but the beauty of this is I have uh, full control. The, the, the thing is with this, and the reason I like the flex is because you know, there's no need for other boxes or dongles or port forwards. I mean, I just open up the smart SDR software and my remote uh, PC and I have full control of everything and I can do it anywhere. Uh, you know, at my daughter's house or, you know, even sitting by the pool uh, in Mexico or Hawaii. I mean, I, I, I've, I've done it. Uh, uh, Steve, or, Steve, yes, it, it's uh, going over a bit. Okay, I'm done basically. Anyway, there's me sitting in uh, in Australia, and um, I, I, you know, I had 250 second, uh, 56 milliseconds of delay, and um, I still had full control. This is me working uh, uh, CW on 40 meters. Okay, guys, thanks a lot for. Um, uh, I had a little bit more there. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, inviting me. I really appreciate it, and um, there's probably no time for questions. But look. Um, visit my qrz.com page. If, uh, I have my emails there and I have a few more, uh, more information on the remote there too.